TV, powered by Communitech, from Waterloo Region in Ontario, Canada, to the world. The conversations you need and want to hear with interesting people on topics at the intersection of technology and humanity. Tech for good. Let's get started. Well, thank you, Talia, and welcome to True North TV. Um, we're joined by a very special guest today, John Baker, the CEO of D2L. Um, John started this company 22 years old in university, systems design engineering, which has produced so many great entrepreneurs in our country. And his commitment and his passion was a belief that education could fundamentally help improve the world. And his commitment at the time was really to try and find a way to bring things online. And at the time, of course, it was pretty hard to do so. And there was a lot of resistance to it. But over the years, he's built a very, very successful company deployed uh, at campuses around the world. Um, and, uh, and now, 22 years later, um, he's here joining us today. Thank you for joining us, John. Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, it's a real pleasure. And, uh, you know, I think, I think I've actually bumped into you even when I was a kid. So uh, I, you've, you've had an ever presence uh, in my life uh, throughout uh, my journey. There's no question. So yes, it's, it's absolutely, absolutely true. And um, it's been, uh, it's been amazing to watch um, uh, the, the success and, and, and the challenges you faced. One year, of course, we awarded you the Intrepid Award because of the battle that you took on in the in the uh, the plains of Texas um, to to battle battle the patent trolls, um, so it's been a it's been quite a journey. As you as you look back, and there's obviously been tremendous highs, um, you know, receiving the award from the governor general, and of course just the sheer success of the company and the impact that you've been able to have as a philanthropist and an investor. But when you look back over the last year number of years since you started this little thing called D2L, what what have been you know, what have you learned? How, what is your, how have you seen education change and, and how has your pr pr perspective changed? Well, that's a big question. Uh, and by the way, that, I remember getting the, that Intrepid Award, so thank you for that. And uh, I remember Tom Jenkins was also getting a, the Entrepreneur Award and was teasing me about the size of my Intrepid Award at the <laughs> during that ceremony. So. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I've noticed about our community, uh, Waterloo, has been just this constant uh, passion and, and passing on the torch, if you will, from one entrepreneur to the next and, and pushing each other to, uh, to really new heights. And I think it's one of the great things about our community. Uh, that's something I never, I never knew when I started, uh, how, how, how important it was to set up in the right community, to get the right folks and to build the right networks and the right peers to help push you in the right direction. And as a, as a company getting started, you know, you got to remember uh, when I started when, when I was 22, there was not even internet in the classroom at uh, the great university of the University of Waterloo. It was uh, something you would go to a lab to go into to, to you know, have access to the internet. And, uh, and that, wasn't, that doesn't seem like that long ago. Uh, and uh, as we go through this uh, transformation, taking uh, what was happening in the traditional classrooms and turning it into a digital experience, most people think about, you know, take what you did, uh, you know, in the classroom and put it online. And we've certainly seen a lot of that uh, is what we call remote learning today as people have had to pivot uh, thanks to COVID-19 into this new experience. But online learning is not just simply taking what you did in the classroom and going online. When, once you go digital, you can optimize the experience. You can do all kinds of things that you couldn't do in that traditional environment. And you can actually get to transform the actual experience to make it better to help actually chip away at, at what actually are the real underlying goals, whether it's, you know, improving engagement with students, helping inspire the next generation to achieve, you know, better outcomes, improving retention, driving uh, growth uh, for the institutions, reaching students you would never be able to reach, breaking down barriers you never thought were possible. Uh, all of those things, uh, as you focus on that singular mission, in our case, um, you know, you start to, you start to really uh, have an impact on a, a lot of people's lives through that focus, that commitment to that, uh, that long-term journey, if you will. And, and it has been a long-term journey, right? <laughs> like, I, you know, I think uh, in the early days, I, thought, I think many people thought we were crazy to go down the path of trying to build something to support online learning uh, when there's so many other opportunities in, in terms of technology. 
Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I kept going back to, there's, there's no, there was no bigger problem to solve than to transform the way the world learns because it's that foundational element that solves all the other problems. If you can produce graduates that can perform at a higher level, then they're going to go off and have a real big impact in their communities and their companies and in the world. So, you know, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been a joy to participate in all of that all the way along. So we're, we're in the middle of, uh, of this pandemic. And of course, um, you know, we talk a lot about the fact that, you know, proximity is now optional. We don't have to have people in the same room and, and that's going to, that's going to disrupt so many aspects of our, of our lives. What do you think it's going to do to education? What do you think it's going to do to universities? How important do you think brand is going to be as we go forward? Oh, that, that's, there's a, there's a few good questions in there. Um, you know, there's, an inflection point that uh, you know people are feeling today, but it's it's really been one that's coming for a long time. Uh, I think what we've seen with uh, COVID nineteen is it's it's really taken you know uh, what we envisioned as what education will look like in twenty thirty, and pulled it forward about ten years. You know, so as we're as we've been doing our roadmap for this year, it's really been you know things that we thought we would be doing you know five to ten years from now, uh, and so. You know, that that future being pulled forward has has you know certainly changed the way that uh, we're all going to learn. You know, I I don't know how uh, if you're running a school, a university, or a company, uh, you can uh, not put in place the right infrastructure to support continuity of learning. And so you know you're not going to want to have events like whether it's a pandemic in this particular case or a snow day or some other uh, you know type of experience throw you off the ability to either onboard employees or to make sure that the students have that continuity of learning. So there's, you know, they can get on to what comes next. Uh, and, uh, and that's been a, certainly been a wake up call and a big effort for a lot of folks around the world, most folks around the world uh, to really be able to, you know, take the next steps now to put in place the right infrastructure so that learning uh, can be more of that essential service, if you will. That, uh, that we've seen our healthcare system, you know, rise to, you know, we, we now all need to rise to thinking about how these digital services can become essential services for us. Do you, the, when you think about um, academic institutions, I know you work with, uh, with, uh, with academic institutions, uh, K to 12, colleges, universities, private schools, et cetera, et cetera, around the world. What kind of conversations are you having with those people about, how permanent this shift is going to be and, and the kinds of opportunities that they see uh, for them. Yeah, I think across every industry that we're calling it the new normal, right? As in, uh, no, you know, very few people are thinking things are going to go back to the way they were. I think less than 10% actually even want that. Um, you know, I think every, everybody's embracing this as a catalyst to move uh, things forward. And, you know, as, as you try out new technologies, and, and again, they got to be the right ones. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll see a, a regression, if you will. Uh, you'll, you'll start to understand the impact that it has. So no one's going to want to go back to, you know, grading papers manually. <laughs> They're not, if, if a technology can do it for them instantly and help provide instant feedback back to students, uh, they can move on to more important activities, if you will. And so uh, I think this change is really just uh, the reinforcement of it, of an inflection point that was already coming. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the big moment, the big catalyst for change has arrived. Uh, and now uh, those that are going to embrace it uh, faster are going to be able to survive through this and then hopefully get onto the other side of it where they can really get back to, you know, having those transformational uh, impacts on students, on, you know, their employees, what, who, whichever sector you want to look at, they're going to be able to get back to, you know, uh, you know, being able to have that real impact on outcomes, if you will. So when we think about, um, when we think about academic institutions globally now, um, mm -hmm. and we think about the fact that uh, we're going to have virtual and we're going to have some sort of hybrid blended model, it creates opportunities for universities like, let's take Purdue as an example, to mm -hmm. be able to, um, you know, escalate the number of students that they can accommodate. How do you think that impacts, you know, sort of the tier two and the tier three universities in North America? And, and should they be concerned about, you know, the fact that if it's all virtual, then we've got a whole new set of, of competitors. 
Uh, well, that's all true. <laughs> so there's there's no uh, there's no question that this is going to be a new environment for everybody. And whenever you have a new environment and you've got new you know competitors, that's going to change things. But but uh, online learning opened up uh, the ability for anyone to learn from any any institution uh, years ago. Um, but it really hasn't been fully embraced yet. Uh, so I, I do think that, you know, the distance that a student travels now to go to school could actually be much greater than it was on average in the past. There's no question that that will be the case. Um, and so what does it mean? It, it means, uh, you know, the different institutions really need to find ways to uh, take on an expanded mandate of reaching every learner uh, of every ability anywhere they live. Um, and, if, and if we take on that responsibility as institutions uh, and take over that as a, as a new mission, uh, it really, it transforms how we think about uh, what we got to deliver as a learning experience. And that's not, that's not easy, Ian, right? So, um, you know, many folks right now are still trying to just make sure that the existing students that have already signed up into the existing programs are well served come the fall. Um, but I, I do think as these technologies, um, get fully embraced and as people make the pivot from just being in an emergency response mode to now, you know, thinking about this as a growth opportunity again, uh, it does open up new avenues for growth, but, but, you know, what an opportunity, if you think about it in the higher education, if we just picked on that segment for a second, um, there's about 150 million uh, folks that are in the higher education sector around the world that are enrolled in schools and universities. And, and if, if, we, uh, if we look at the actual true demand, it should be hundreds of millions more. And so if, if all of a sudden all the universities and colleges today can reach a much wider audience of students, no matter where they lived in the world, you know, how much better would the world be? Uh, and to me, I think that's, that's really important. That's really important. Oh, what a what an incredibly um, helpful uh, insight and perspective. Um, I love the idea of this is an opportunity to increase capacity and 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 provide education to so many many more people. Um, and I think there's a a bunch of things that are emerging out of this uh, that are a result of the speed at which we've been able to change, but also you know um, the ability for us to all be skilled and trained in uh, living virtually or partially living virtually. Um, I think that what there are many conversations happening around right now are, are, are there things that we can keep that are really powerful and useful and valuable coming out of this? Um, as you, as you sort of look at uh, this, it seems like a journey, but it's, it's four months. Um, you know, what have you learned? Uh, what have you learned about, you know, your team and what have you, what do you see as being, um, the things that we want to try and hang on to? Oh, wow. Uh, again, there's so much, so much to talk about with that, uh, really good question, Ian. Um, you know, uh, A, I, you can tell I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm always looking for the, uh, what's good in terms of the change that's come, come our direction. How do we take this and uh, take this really terrible event and find find ways to you know judo it uh, just like any entrepreneur would uh, into something that's going to be positive? How do we how do we take uh, all the bad that's happening right now and find ways to to turn those lemons into lemonade? I know I'm just using classic lines here, but uh, boy, like uh, as an entrepreneur, you face these things all the time, and it's an opportunity to really rise to the challenge. Uh, and that's probably what I'm probably most proud of, of our team, right? So things that uh, we thought were impossible, you know, weeks ago or months ago are now happening. Uh, you know, for example, it used to take us weeks to stand up a new site for a client. It now takes us less than an hour, right? Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't think um, I can under, under uh, you know, understate how proud I am of the, how our team and our clients came together to get through the crisis very quickly. And in a way where, you know, we were available hundred percent of the time, you know, as, as uh, you know, the usage of our system in some cases was up 40, 40 times, not 40%, 40 times 
So, you know, uh, th these are not overall, just features, <laughs> just for, for clarity, but still up overall very significantly. The, the, um, that, that's not easy work. And for, for folks to quickly adapt and change and, and just the adaptability of us humans uh, to the change that's put, put on us is, uh, is incredible. That capacity of ours as, uh, you know, uh, to embrace that and to look for the good in that and to help each other out uh, through that change. I think, uh, uh, you know, brought out the best in the people, uh, you know, as, as we faced on a, a very, you know, crazy crisis. So John, I too am an optimist and I do see this as a big opportunity for Canada in a, in a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, you know, from a talent perspective, uh, you know, one of the, one of the biggest limitations we had in Waterloo region was the fact that we're small um, and we don't have the large talent pools. And apparently that doesn't matter anymore. Uh, we've got some tremendous opportunities to, you know, invite the, the best and the brightest in the world to come and, um, and, and be with us, work with us, live with us, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of tremendous opportunities. We, uh, you were one of the leaders who helped us stand up the uh, Future of Work and Learning Coalition um, a while back. Um, and uh, we, I, we interviewed you as part of that. We talked a bit about the future and the importance of, of, uh, of the shift in uh, the gig economy and in lifelong learning. But it's kind of like the future of work and learning is now, now. And uh, what, uh, you know, what, what, what is it that we should be, what we should be focused on right now? So uh, in terms of the, what's the new future? Because like, I'm happy to chat about that. Um, yeah, yeah, please. The, the, what is the new future? Perfect. Yeah. So what, uh, so again, just similar to education, uh, things that we thought were going to be the future, 10 years from now are actually here today. And, um, and same thing with the future of work. Um, the things that we thought were gonna be the future are not here today yet, uh, but are here within the next year. <laughs> and so the, the scramble right now to put in place the right infrastructure to support the reskilling of millions, uh, you know, we thought that we were gonna be facing that challenge down over the next five to 10 years. We literally have a, a, a an issue to, to tackle in the next few weeks uh, to get that, to get that effort up and running. And, and yeah, and, and I'm definitely would like to uh, happy to chat about that more too, Ian, as, as uh, I'm taking a very close look at that at, at a national level right now, as we speak. Um, and then if you look at the future, like what does five years from now look like, you know, I think it comes back to that earlier point I mentioned, which is, you know, we transition from this, these things as being nice to haves to being essential services. We can't go through another bump like this and have this major of an impact on our economies or on our schools or on our universities or on our companies without having the right infrastructure in place to deliver really high quality experiences to work our way through them uh, much faster. Um, because we've got to be able to, sh to absorb these shocks, have the resiliency uh, built in to be able to, you know, help millions of people, you know, make their way through these types of uh, events uh, better than we did uh, this time around. And I think we did a pretty good job shouldering a lot of the, the weight uh, of, of the big transformation that's happened to our economies. But we've got a lot of job, you know, a big job ahead of us to, to rebuild the right infrastructure as we go forward. And, and a lot of that infrastructure, in my opinion, has to be digital. Um, there's going to be a lot of traditional infrastructure that gets built, but there's going to have to be a lot of digital infrastructure uh, that uh, gets built out in the next uh, weeks, months, years ahead to make sure we can absorb these, uh, these shocks to the system uh, again in the future. And I, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think that, um, you know, certainly um, uh, there's, a, there's a need for resilient domestic supply chains in uh, whether it's PPEs or it's energy or food or- Learning. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, I would throw, you know, definitely internet in there. I think we've all come to the realization that uh, we need ubiquitous, you know, broadband access for everybody in the country. Um, and, it's, and I think it's going to create some interesting opportunities because I think, I think increasingly people are going to be able to live, work where they live. Um, and, and that is, is going to open up opportunities for us to, you know, capture the economic potential of a lot of communities that have not being able to do so just because of the fact that, you know, the jobs were in Toronto and everyone had to move to Toronto. 
Um, and now I think uh, I think we've got some real real opportunity for for uh, for for you know economic growth right across the country because of this this uh, this new reality that we've got. I couldn't have said it better myself, Ian. That's uh, you know th- that's exactly what uh, what our opportunity is in front of us today, and what a great opportunity for a country as widespread as Canada uh, or the U.S. Pick any other large country. Uh, you know, all of a sudden you can now tap into the, the uh, you know, the human capital across the whole country, not just in the, in the major city centers. It's great. No, it's, uh, it's interesting. So, you know, when I say, say that I think that internet is, um, um, you know, infrastructure of national importance, um, I, I think, I think, you know, uh, learning platforms are infrastructure of national importance. I guess the question I've got, John, is, you know, uh, we could stand up uh, 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 infrastructure in the, in the form of D2L across the country. We could, um, we, we could have this because, you know, we all know it's about, uh, it's about platform plays that win. And this is a beautiful platform play. It, it, is, would that ultimately lead to the, the uh, eventuality where do you see a day when there's going to be a, a D2L school? Or university? Well, th- there's been a lot of folks that have been writing about this, right? Will we see, you know, a school powered by, you know, Facebook or Apple or others? Uh, D12 uh, definitely powers a lot of these schools already, right? So we're, we're behind the scenes for almost about half of the students across the country today. Um, and so if we can, you know, continue to provide the right technology to support uh, these institutions, I think it's, it's a great opportunity. And I think thinking about it as a national infrastructure is spot on. Uh, You get economies of scale from that. Um, And many of the smaller institutions are, or think about the small businesses. Canada's 99% small businesses. Uh, They don't have the horsepower to put in place the world-class infrastructure that's needed. So we've got to find ways to to put, put it in place so that we can get people, you know, back to work or help these uh, organizations get the digital skills they're going to need or the other skills they're going to need to thrive as the economy sort of charges forward. So yeah, I'm, I'm clearly biased, but I, th- I think uh, those types of digital infrastructure plays, and you could, you could use same example with Shopify or name any other great, uh, you know, s- part of our economy where, you know, it's, it's not just about learning, it's about other, other pieces of this puzzle. Uh, those, those become really good plays to, to, to support the question. Yeah, and I think the idea of thinking about um, about infrastructure in different ways and really having a focus on if of, on digital. If we if we know that we're going to be virtual or we're going to be some sort of hybrid in the future, then we have to get these platforms right. Yeah, another one would be uh, health, <laughs> which is going to be a hard one to do, or and you, you uh, or just simply identity. Uh, there's no shortage of opportunities in this space to build out good digital infrastructure. And the neat thing about digital infrastructure too, not to make the case too strong, but you know, I, uh, I don't think you can underscore it enough. I, a lot of digital infrastructure you know, is, is uh, something that you can build out starting today. You don't have to wait for building permits. You can literally start the work tomorrow and hire up the people as quickly as possible to get to work on these projects. Well, we just had a conversation last week with Alex Benet, former CIO of the Government of Canada, and talking about the need for us to uh, to build a very, very strong digital backbone for our country and to really focus on digital identity um, as being must-haves uh, to equip ourselves to both well, exploit the opportunity that we have before us, and also be resilient for for when something like this happens to us again. Yeah, that's yeah, and Alex is a very good speaker on this topic. I. I think I actually wrote a chapter in one of his books recently. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, th- I think he speaks very well on this topic. And again, uh, just another example of how community tech pulls together good thought leaders. <laughs> we, do our, we do our best. Ian, uh, you're on to something as uh, another topic, right? And I, I, know you're, I know we want to wrap up here. But nope, nope, it's all good. You're, you're hitting on like a, a critical one, which is uh, how, do you, how do you build world leaders? Pick whichever country you're in but how do you build companies that are going to become world leaders in their domain? And uh, that is, that is another, another thing that we've got to focus on. Um, you know, there are certain countries that have figured out a very good industrial strategy uh, that uh, really help, help them propel uh, their organizations or companies to world leading status. Uh, you know, I, I do think that's an area that we could probably focus on as well as a country. 
Well, I couldn't I couldn't agree more for the need for us to uh, to have industrial strategy and really focus on building great Canadian companies. I mean, the one thing that we've learned out of all of this is that you know global supply chains, when push comes to shove, people look on inward first, whether it's America or it's China. And you know what a great opportunity for us to be building out um, you know these supply chains, these companies. They're building products that we need that are critical to the national interest. But at the same time, we're building them and we're selling them, selling them to the world. So we can build not only what we need, we can build what the world needs. And we can have this incredible brand called Canada, which is so trusted around the world um, as, the, as the banner over the top of the whole new industries we've got the opportunity to, uh, to develop. And I think, you know, back to the, the point around the digital infrastructure that we need, what a tremendous opportunity for us to be looking at great Canadian companies that we could get behind. Uh, to help deploy um, these platforms um, uh, right across the country. Yeah, and uh, you very well said again, Ian. You know, as as we build up our our, our companies, we also have to remember that uh, Canadian companies, at the bulk of what they sell is an export market, um, and so constantly figuring out how do we build better connections around the world and building out outposts. Uh, I know that's one of the other uh, initiatives that Communitech is running in terms of helping to build better connections to the other parts of the world is, is really important too. Um, and the more that we can put in place the right uh, components to help companies, you know, start, grow, succeed, uh, become world leaders, uh, that's going to be great for the world, not just for Canada, the world uh, will benefit from those efforts. And, and I, I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Uh, there's, a, there's a slogan that came out of the last economic strategy table around uh, made better in Canada, which doesn't mean just buy Canada. It's, that's, not what, that's not what it's meaning. It's like, how do we actually, whether it's, uh, you know, things that you've been promoting for a number of years around tech for good um, or good design principles around privacy or accessibility or other things. How do we, how do we take things that are, are particularly strong in this region, in this country, and build products that are world-class, world-leading, and take them out to the world. Um, you know, more that we can do that, the better it is for everybody. Well, I couldn't agree more with you, John. And um, I, I did want to take an opportunity to thank you for joining us today. Uh, you have been uh, 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 from, you know, having met many, many years ago to when I first came to the community in 2004. Uh, you've always been there to, uh, to be a huge promoter. You were a, a fantastic chair of the board to Communitech and, and you continue to be a great leader on, uh, on uh, policy and, and issues of national importance and of course a, a great leader as far as thinking about the future of education. So thank you for joining us today, John. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for all the great work that you're doing. It really matters more today than ever before. Thank you, Ian. You bet. And thank you all very much for joining us and we'll see you next Tuesday at noon for True North TV. Thanks for watching this episode of True North TV. Subscribe to Communitech's YouTube channel to get notified of future episodes of True North TV.